In this video I'm going to give a quick overview of the history of the end of the SO2 trading program in the United States. If you're not familiar with the SO2 trading program, I refer you to other sources including some of the sources listed at the end of the uh, this lecture in the references. Uh, but I'm going to give a quick overview of the program here. So it was established in 1990 under Title IV of the 1990 U.S. Clean Air Act. Uh, this was passed during the uh, first Bush administration. It started in 1995 with Phase 1, in which 374 large coal-fired power plants were introduced into the system. In 2000, 1,400 more plants entered the system. Uh, this was Phase 2. So we had uh, almost 2,000 coal-fired power plants participating in trading, and they were allowed to trade allowances across the country so that if one uh, coal-fired power plant wanted to increase their emissions, they could look for another plant who would reduce their emissions and sell them the allowances necessary to stay in compliance. There were some a lot of very attractive features to the program. First of all, it was very successful in reducing emissions. Uh, by 2000, emissions were 40 percent lower than the 1980 levels. It had really good monitoring. They had a continuing, continuous emissions monitoring system, so there was a high degree of certainty um, for the regulators and for the market participants that uh, reduction in emissions actually was being done for every allowance that was generated and traded. And it had very low transactions costs. This market was uh, quite fluid uh, and uh, alloc uh, allocations, uh, credits were traded uh, on uh, Chicago Board of Trade and, and you could go in and buy one. Even private citizens and, and environmental economics classes frequently bought uh, allocations from the SO2 trading program. And you saw that in the data. So these are um, data from Cantor CO2E. I don't know how accurate they are, but they seem reflective of what we do know about the program. Uh, we see volume that was in the range of 50 to uh, 200,000 uh, units being traded or allocations being traded per month. We saw the prices are grew uh, pretty regularly from uh, July of 2003 up until 2006 and then fell uh, through this 2006-2007 period. And the people that reviewed and analyzed the program uh, consistently found that it was uh, quite successful and uh, Stavins wrote in 2005 uh, it, that the program has had exceptionally positive welfare effects and benefits far outseeded costs. Uh, Tesor, Tesoriero wrote in 2010 uh, that the standard, uh, that the acid rain program was the standard of how a market based system can control emissions at reasonable cost. So we had a really nice model of trading with uh, clear prices good control, a strong cap, all of the things that you would look for if you want to establish a pollution trading program. If we look out a little bit further though and you start looking not just up until 2007 but out in 2009 and beyond you see that the allocations uh, the market became much uh, more volatile uh, in terms of the number of uh, uh, allowances sold uh, going almost to zero and then up and then and then sort of petering out here at the end and if we look just at this very end period you'll see that uh, from January 2009, uh, the prices dropped substantially and then basically vanished. And we've seen no uh, trading since, uh, uh, looks like uh, April of 2010 was the last date that um, Cantor CO2 reported any tr allocations being traded. What happened? Well, it goes back to 2004 when EPA ruled that the District of Columbia and 28 other states were contributing to non-attainment in downwind states. That is, emissions from those states were causing other states, neighboring states, to come out of compliance with the Clean Air Act. Now this is a problem because that's not allowed in the Clean Air Act. Uh, EPA responded in 2005 by establishing what they called the Clean Air Interstate Rule, which established regional 
regional caps and reduce the aggregate cap. Um, the market responded. You can see prices rose following that. They also rose as a result of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, by 2006, sources began to install controls, putting more scrubbers on their plants, and prices fell um, dramatically. But the market seemed to be continuing to work it under the clean air interstate rule. Uh, bad things happened in 2008. Uh, a court ruled in 2008 that CARE didn't do the job. CARE does not comply with the Clean Air, air Act, which requires uh, that um, states uh, not contribute significantly to non-attainment in downwind states. Um, and trading can do that. If I buy an allowance which allows me to increase my emissions and my emissions then uh, contribute to non-attainment uh, in a neighboring state, that's a violation of the Clean Air, um, Clean Air Act and the judge in 2008 ruled uh, that's not going to fly. You've got to start all over. Um, so EPA went back to the drawing board and in July of 2010 uh, they established what was called the transport rule. Uh, this was a preliminary uh, ruling on how they were going to deal with the problem uh, but the consequences on the market were immediate. Uh, you can see in 2008 CARE was very vacated. Back here prices fell, fell, volume um, dropped off to zero. Uh, by when the transport rule was issued in July of 2010, there have been no trades since that time. And indeed, there have been no more, there has been no more trading in the National SO2 trading program uh, since uh, July of 2010. Is this a surprise? Well, Certainly, a lot of the market participants um, are surprised, but in retrospect, uh, we shouldn't be all that surprised uh, because we know that uh, the theory behind pollution trading is that if one uh, pollut polluter increases its load, we have to get a, an equivalent reduction uh, by somebody else, and that reduction should leave the air quality uh, impacts on the region unchanged. Uh, but we knew that wasn't going to happen. Uh, this, these are um, pictures from the 1991 NAPAP review of the uh, SO2 trading program or, or analysis um, prior to the implementation of the SO2 trading program. And we see that here in this graph we see without trading, these are the ex expected loads of SO2. With trading, these are the expected loads of SO2. And the problem is that you'll see that there are some areas that are red and orange indicating that the with trading we actually see an increase in loading relative to without trading. So what does that tell us? Well it means that trading can lead to disparate uh, environmental impacts and uh, since disparate environmental impacts across state are basically not allowed uh, that's a going put us in, at risk of violating the Clean Air Act. Uh, furthermore, the pre-implementation analysis seems to have completely ignored any effect of trading on ozone levels, which is an important air quality uh, problem that has particularly gathered attention in the last 20 years, and no attention to the regional non-attainment programs problems. So uh, the analysis that, that was done prior to uh, the SO2 trading program uh, sort of uh, indicated that we are going to have problems, but then we continue to forward ignoring those potential problems. So um, this is an issue. Uh, the SO2 trading program had clear monitoring, it had well-defined caps, it had thick markets, it had everything that you would want. So this does not bode well for other um, applications, particularly water quality trading, where none of those conditions are satisfied what's the chance that we're going to be able to to expand um, uh, trading into these other media where conditions are not nearly as favorable uh, and I think anybody looking at these markets needs to be uh, somewhat uh, take the lessons from that and be a little bit concerned um, what do we learn from the SO2 trading program well pollution problem problems are rarely if ever as easy as a simple textbook model would suggest there's spatial heterogeneity, there's interaction with other pollutants and pollution problems, and you can't ignore these physical and legal realities. 
forever. You've got to be um, realistic about uh, what the physical and regulatory environment in which your program exists. So what's going to happen now? Well, in July of 2011, uh, EPA finalized what's called the Cross-State Air Pollution Rule. Um, it set up four trading programs, uh, SO2, uh, trading program for SO2 in states where more reductions are needed, and SO2 trading program in states where less reductions are needed, annual uh, nitrous oxide emissions and seasonal NOx emissions. It's got state-level um, caps on trading or on, on total emissions. and Basically, it, it seems that the national SO2 trading program has definitely ended. Uh, there may be some regional trading. There's certainly likely to be some state trading. But um, it's not necessarily the end of trading, but it's the end of the, the national trading approach. Uh, so uh, we can look back on the SO2 trading pro program certainly as a grand experiment. And in many ways, it worked well. Uh, but we should also uh, learn from uh, the end of the SO2 trading program about what are the prospects for trading in other media. I'm going to close by simply putting up the slides of uh, a slide with some references that I used in preparing these remarks.